All right, I think we have most of our participants here, so I think we can start. Uh, good evening, my name is Naomi Bird. I am the Research Facilitator in Indigenous Initiatives at Carleton University. In my position, I support the Onoco Indigenous Research Institute and the Office of the AVP Indigenous Teaching, Learning and Research. Our AVP, uh, Dr. Kohande Horn-Miller is unable to join us this evening, so I will be assuming the moderator role for tonight. Um, before introducing our guest, I would like to provide a quick housekeeping point. Uh, we have 15 minutes at the end of the talk for any questions that you might have. Um, at any point during the talk that one of those questions do come up, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. You could just click it, type it in there, and we'll get to it uh, shortly after Floyd is concluded. Uh, now I will introduce our guest. So, uh, like I said, we, I, I'm actually, I support the Onoco Indigenous Research Institute. As part of the Onoco Indigenous Research Institute, we do have a visiting scholar. Uh, Floyd Favel is our newest visiting scholar this year, and Floyd comes to us from Saskatchewan, and he is a member of the Palmaker Cree Nation. Floyd is, a, sorry, <clears throat> a theater theorist, writer, teacher, director, essayist, and Cree traditionalist. He has studied theater in both Denmark and Italy. Floyd is an accomplished essayist and writer and has many of his works published and translated into Polish language. Floyd is not a stranger to post-secondary institutions and has worked as a guest lecturer for the University of Katowice, I hope I got that right, Floyd, in Poland and the adjunct professor for Concordia University. Floyd is currently the curator of the Palmaker Museum and is a director of the Palmaker Indigenous a performance festival. Floyd also produced a documentary, uh, Ashes, Ashes and Embers, a film about the Delmas Indian uh, Residential School, which premiered at the International Film Festival in Montreal, and it has been screened at the Imaginative um, Film Festival in Toronto. So on behalf of the Onoco Indigenous Research Institute, I would like to welcome our visiting scholar, Floyd Fable. Thank you, Naomi, for the the presentation. Um, <clears throat> thank you, um, Alex, for the tech direction, and to um, Sarah for my research assistant, and um, and to Anako and the Carleton University for making this um, this phase of the research possible, and then um, and to Dr. Ola Nierberg of Montreal, who who. Um, facilitated the beginning stages of this research uh, about eight years ago here in Montreal, which allowed me the platform to try out exercises <clears throat> in performance. And, uh, and also to my principal collaborator, Dr. Sabina, Sabina Svetasen Podstowska of uh, Poland, who has been my principal collaborator, making the ideas real, physical for the last few years and to Dr. Kahente Horn Miller of uh, Concordia for facilitating all this. So I want to thank there's too many people to thank. So I'll leave it at that uh, before I start. Um, I'm dividing my uh, presentation into three parts as in the the Cree word for understanding is in Stokhtamuin. And it has the number three in there, in stuff. And um, the reason for this is understanding is based on the life cycle of a human being, which is the birth, the crawling, and the walking. So um, that's how I will, I structured my lecture is uh, my presentation is following um, the Cree word for understanding. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from a text that was published. It's called Red People, Red Magic, published in a few places. And um, this, rather than presenting an academic presentation, uh, I will um, I will present present my theories, the theories and ideas of the research within an artistic and literary manner. And uh, because the research takes place in the realm of theater, or not academics. In, I'm not an academic in, uh, in the theater world. And um, 
So here we go. My name is Morning Traveler. I was born in the moon when the choke cherries are ripe, and I grew up within my language, surrounded by the tales of old. I went to school in nearby towns. In winters, our bus would be greeted by the dull explosions against our windows, white snowballs fashioned by hateful little hands. I did not know that such a beautiful thing as being an Indian could also be such a terrible thing. We are the first generation born free from the past system and the approval or disapproval of the Indian agent free to move and travel. I studied theater and I have traveled the world, talked with many wise ones and many foolish, counting coup in many enemy lands. The main ideas into the research entitled NPC are inspired by the work of Suzuki Tadashi of Toga, Japan, and who questioned the idea of theater done in a colonial European manner while ignoring inherent Japanese uses of body, voice, and structure. Thus inspired, including a personal visit with him, I thought that we too, as Indigenous people here in Canada, that we could create our own theater process originating in the earth of Turtle Island. As Indigenous people, we did not have theater, but we had storytelling. Theater is a colonial art form, not from this land. The research has these ideas. Indigenous storytelling, ceremony, and culture as the base for Indigenous performance methods. Indigenous performance as an artistic genre with its own methods, body of knowledge and practice open to all peoples and not defined by colonial identity. It is an experiment of, um, of ceremony and performance within an Indigenous structures on an in an Indigenous community. The ideas and theories have been articulated and published in Poland in the Polish language translated by Dr. Aneta Glowaczka and Dr. Eugenia Soczka in a book called Pizaci Zeziemi or Earthwards. That's um, in the context of um, where um, I began my theater ideas and training. The context at that time was um, a Canada very much living in an apartheid-like system where our people um, were the first generation to have gone to school. We were the first ones to have liberty to travel anywhere we wanted in Canada, our generation when we were born. Prior to that, our people had been oppressed by um, a past system and we basically lived in an open, open air um, prisons, you could say. And all across this country in the 1960s, our people were severely oppressed and uh, tormented and traumatized by the colonial settler state. Despite the fact that in 1967, Lester Pearson Canada had the Expo 67 in Montreal to present the open, beautiful face of Canada, but what those people didn't see is what they were doing to our people all across this country in secrecy and in silence. And this is where everybody in my generation, this is how we grew up and this is how we were educated. So now as adults, that was a big formation of our artistic and cultural theories. And so this is where I emerged. And it was always my contention that theater was an intercultural art that it was a universal art, that you can be free there because it's art. But that was not the case. I quickly found out that theater very much is a reflection of the colonial society, which it has emerged from, which it reflects. And um, as a result, I was not accepted into the theater programs in this country due to accent, 
and the visible indigenous identity, poverty, and geographical remoteness. Thus, I had no options except to travel across the Atlantic in order to get an education. I went to school across the big water on the edge of the gray North Sea. And amongst the olive groves and vineyards of a southern country, and I have returned a stranger amongst my tribe. If I could silence my nostalgia, I would have never returned. But here I am in the prison of my country, Ntaski Oma, Turtle Island. When in doubt, think of your first day in the theater. Maybe my first day was flying over this country. Closing my eyes, I rested my head on the seat on my way across the big water. There, amongst the marble colonnades of a foreign city, I could dream incognito, unremarkable, and drink espresso at an outdoor cafe in a Venetian piazza, free from this country, which has undone so many of my people. There, I studied in Italy, at the Centro de Lavoro de Kutowski and at the Tukak, Tukak Theatre of Denmark. Um, I was introduced there to theater derived from your own indigenous culture and your own uh, personal experience amongst your own people. And, um, and it was there that I had the idea, began the ideas of possibly creating theater derived from our own cultures, our own rituals, social structures, and, and developing exercises from this to try to create a theater method that was accessible to people from all over the world. And that's what I have been working on for the last few decades. If I could silence my nostalgia, I would have never returned, but here I am in the prison of my country. Nitaski Uma, this is my land, Turtle Island. Indigenous identity as a definition for indigenous performance is obsolete. For many years now, I have worked within the Canadian theatre system, a system that reflects the colonial structure of Canada. It is a prison from which I am struggling to awake from. One day, like Black American author James Baldwin, I will live in exile across the big water and search for an artistic freedom beyond the colonial structure of this country. The category of indigenous identity is dead. It is a dead construct that has no meaning for the disadvantaged poor indigenous people that still suffer from racism and colonial policies. But it has financial and career meaning for those with imagined and or distant indigenous ancestry, indigenous in name and grants only. The road of life is narrow. It is where the heart is pierced by the arrows of a hundred colonial methods and lies. It is where traitors stand, wearing red masks, knives hidden under blankets, with a smile, fake handshake, and a forked tongue, they guard the entrance to the ration house, where a people's soul is weighed in the balance of a government scale. Part three, walking. The unified theory of indigenous performance, indigenous story. As I stated earlier, um, theater is a colonial um, art form. It's not from here, this country. It came from across the big water. So we didn't have a, a theater system as indigenous people. But what we did have was story. And um, story, had um, these um, seven points that define it. And it is these seven points that is the doorways into method and process 
that can be accessible to all peoples. And later I will show you some examples uh, of some of the student work we undertook here in Ottawa. Story has narratives, which is types of stories, rhythm of voice, structure of text, introductions, incarnation, imitation, scenes, dialogue or monologues. It has that. It has also what I call Wanyetu Wohapi, which is Lakota for winter count, as a method of analysis and story breakdown. Because winter count, Wanyetu Wohapi, these are narrative images and they have um, an art and their narrative principles can be applied to um, a theatrical text. In our cases, I have been working with permission from uh, the Iroquois, the great law, the story of the Ganawida, because I feel all peoples on this island should know that story because it is one of the founding stories of Turtle Island. And everybody in the world should actually know this story because it is a global story, very much like the story of the Buddha and uh, who has a global influence as well. So we have been working with this story and applying these principles to it. Narratives, Wanyetu Wuhapi, and Plains Indian Sign Language and Gesture. Plains Indian Sign Language is a, it's a universal across Turtle Island with variations, of course. And is this a way for people to communicate through gestures that have nouns and verbs? and they're able to communicate with any tribe. Plains Indian Sign Language and Gesture has been taught to us by uh, Dr. Lanny Rielberg from the Crow Nation in Montana. He is one of the few dozen or so fluent Plains language speaker, Indian Sign Language speakers left in North America. That's my friend, Dr. Lanny Rielberg right there at Palmer Kirk. Plains Indian Sign Language, along with Winter Count, they indicate how we as Indigenous people structure sentence, image, and action. So they're a doorway into our own creativity. And these are Indigenous systems that have been derived here. And these are our starting points towards method and process. Every nation has their own image, and narrative processes. These are ones that I have picked for my research purposes only. And along the way, I sought permission from elders and experts to give me permission to work with these. I got into sign language because my grandmother was deaf. So I seen some of her signs. And later when I got to know sign, sign language, I realized some of the signs she made to me they were part of the Plains Indian Sign Language lexicon. As well, at a ceremony once in Southern Saskatchewan, an old man, I, he went like this to me. And so I followed and I went there and I asked him, what was that? He said, come here, sit down, get off your horse and sit on the ground. That's what he said, he was teasing. So I, I asked him, do you know this sign language? I was very young at that time. And he said, yeah, and he showed me more signs. And this was when I was a student in Denmark and Italy. And so this was on my summer vacation. And I remember being very touched by that and feeling that there is something there. There is something in sign that we can use for future generations. Not only that it was a, a hidden and dead and dying language, not only that, not only to revive it, but to be used in, um, in um, the development of indigenous performance method. So that's where we have been going with that. The other quality of story is always takes place in a specialized space, a sacred space, you could say. And um, the other one is light, the use of light natural from the sun or from the fire, candle, lamp, 
and this reflecting on the people in there to create shadows. And also from the outside is the use of shadows. So use of light and shadows. The other quality is it's multi-generational because it incorporates people from all generations when you tell stories, the youth and the elders, the adults. And the other quality is, oh, this is myself, Lanny Realbird and Milton Tatusis, a big supporter of um, the festival of culture and language. And um, he helped found the Pomac Indigenous Performance Festival when he was a, a counselor back, on, um, back in his counselor days. The other quality is multidimensionality. Our stories are doorways and also reflect the, our multidimensional world. This world we live in is not the only dimensional dimension, but there is many level, there is other levels to it. And so this is what our stories speak of. And this theoretically and ideally is any performance method we propose and are proposing must also have multidimensionality. It accepts this as a natural reality of life here on the earth. Um, so those are the working principles um, that are starting points for our research. You could say these are research tools, everything I have just mentioned. Research tools applied to a story, in this case, Peacemaker, story of the great law. And these begin to access our mind, spirit, indigenous worldview and multidimensionality. When we speak of um, indigenous, indigenizing theater or indigenizing space, there's many ways to do it. Some people, they'll take over a space, an existing space like a theater or else a university and program indigenous con content into it. Um, or the other way is on the other side is you create your own indigenous space within your own indigenous community and your own indigenous lands, which is what we have done here on Pondmaker. Through our own spaces, our own cultural understanding of architecture, our own relationship with nature. Because nature is, um, it's not an idea that it's alive, it's a reality. Nature is always our witness. So you must live and work in nature. A long time ago when I was young, I met an elder and he had mentioned that if you have, if a person wants to be a traditional practitioner, a ceremonialist, he said, you have to live in nature, he said. That's where power, the energy comes from there, he said. Um, you have, that's one of the requirements of, of uh, being a ceremonialist is living in a country with nature. And um, so this, uh, that, that's one of the formative ideas also in, when we propose indigenous performance method is, like, is that it should take place in our own structures, in our own lands. We don't need to feel equal by dancing on the white man's stage or eating at their table or celebrating how they celebrate. Um, if you feel to do that makes you equal, then I think that is colonial. If you have to search for that equality um, by dancing on their stages. I dreamed of an impossible theater in this dead and dying land. In my dream, I awoke and I was on a grass covered plateau. The land was untouched, covered in flowers and protected by snow capped mountains. I saw a man riding from the east. I walked further and we met at a rock. He rode a little buckskin horse, small and intelligent looking. The rider was old yet vibrant. He smiled, the smile of a man who can laugh at life. He carried a knife at his waist, a pen, and a small notebook protruded from a pocket in his military-style jacket. It was the French dramatist Jean Genet. 
Have a seat, mon ami, he called. I sat tired and afraid. But his presence filled me with calm. We sat and watched the eagles gliding in the distance. His horse off the grass nearby. Moi, like you, people walked all over me. They cast me to the shadows of society. They thought me stupid and worthless, like an Indian, a redskin. I am like you, a poor Indian. I am the red Indian of all France. He lit and smoked our cigarette. Mon petit redskin, the theater came to your shores on a rat infested ship in the 1500s. When it landed, your great people saw the power in this orphan. This theater severed from its motherland where the practitioners of this strange art were called whores, witches, and fools. Your noble sa sages and shamans called the theater their younger brother, younger brother to their great rituals. They saw that on the stage and in their ceremonies, these two beings could become brothers in the act of performance. The act of performance and the act of ritual meet at the level of the higher self, the next dimension closest to this human world where spirit beings dwell. But your spiritual leaders reached out to this younger brother. Welcome this, to this land, our sacred island, Turtle Island, earth built on the back of a turtle. We are the island's original peoples. In the future, many of our nations will die from massacres and sickness. We give you permission to stay here so that many generations from now, nurtured by this sacred soil, your healing art will be reborn from where you have taken root. One day you will be from here. That is, if you take sustenance from that which has already been here. If you do not, you will not become a brother to us. You will always be a stranger here. But if you become one with this land and become our true brother, a sacred theater will be born, nourished by the infinite and internal power of our island. And through this art, we can shake hands with our ancestors. We too shall be changed as we embrace you as a brother. We will take what is good and make it ours. One day our people will dance, sing, speak in rhythms and structures derived from our rituals. The spectators will give us dead flowers, they will clap their hands together and we will bow in gratitude to the seen and the unseen audience. We will take the power behind our ceremonies and change the theater. We can only do this if you let yourself be changed by us. And if you do, then we will meet you in the twilight under the evening star, soul brothers, soul sisters, different but one. The language is metaphor, simile, abstraction, prisms which refract, which refract, refract supernatural realities. Ritual and theater, though brothers, must be different things. We cannot mix them up. Theater teaches morality on earth. Rituals speak to the gods. Do not mix them or you will fall into the water. Not long ago, a prophet arose from amongst the Europeans who have enslaved the world. His name was Antonin Artaud, a theater director, my friend and countryman. In 1936, he journeyed to your sacred island, to Mexico, and ate the holy sacrament, peyote in the land of the Tarahumara. He came in peace. He did not come to enslave your people or steal the land and put you on reservations. Hand extended, he came seeking healing as that is what your people offered. And healing is what Peter, the younger brother, must eventually offer. Without healing, there is no art. You, my friend, mon ami, when you go back, you will see your people hat in hand, knocking at the white man's doors, wanting to eat at the white man's table, dance on his stage like a white man. They will be only white people in red masks, 
red people only on a magic typewriter, indigenous identity only living on paper. Your people's spirit will be for sale, suppressed in silence by red masks bought by a golden coin. This is not the way, my friend. You will become lost and foolish. You will never find the true way. The only way can come from within and from your own land. Never forget the fire, the rock, the trees, the sun and the wind, the stars and the moon, the teepee and the earth lodge, the longhouse. Therein lies the theater you seek. Red skin, red people of the earth, this European civilization must die within you and be replaced by the ashes of your civilizations. From the embers will come a new beginning, red magic to lift your people's spirit. So to that end, <clears throat> at our lake on Palmaker, we have built different traditional structures, some derived from an earth lodge, some from a long Anishinaabe lodge, teepee, and um, we have built an off-grid uh, performance site to, to um, I guess, to try to incarnate the um, indigenous beliefs of our people, which is to live close to nature and in harmony. And we invite people from all over the world to come and work with us. Because at the end of the day, any performance method must be intercultural and accessible to all people. Because that's the only way theater will grow as it is theater as it has been all my life, is very much a white middle class affair in this country. And it's the same with the universities. The universities are geared towards those, um, those professional theaters. So the university teaching systems as well in the theaters reflect those systems. And I believe that um, research such as what we have been undertaken at, the, at um, Carlton, Anaco, and at Concordia, eventually we'll break down these systems and create the idea of a theater that is open to all people and universal and welcoming to all peoples. If that is the case, then we have truly created an indigenous theater from this land, a truly indigenous theater. And now I'm gonna show you some videos. Um, um, let's see, this is one of my students that, um, she uh, gave me permission to show her video. She's working, applying these methods, principles, to the great law um, that um, I asked for permission if I could work with it. And I used the version uh, that was written by Brian Rice in his book, um, The Haudenosaunee. And this is what the students have been working on. And so this is one of my students her name is Maya from Ottawa. With her permission, she presented her application of indigenous method to the story. My father comes from a lineage of people who have migrated from India to East Africa, Tanzania, and then again to Turtle Island. And it is here on Turtle Island where my father met my mother. My mother is from Guatemala the land of many trees. And it is through their love that I am now here, an unceded, unsurrendered, Algonquin territory, completing my undergraduate degree in environmental studies with a minor in indigenous studies. The story that I will be telling today is that of the great law and the peacemaker. The role of woman, though overlooked, is what stood out to me the most. And I structure my telling of the story based off of the roles of women. Because in my life, my mother, my sister, my cousin, my aunt, and my grandmothers are my guiding light. And when I read this story, and I read the, about the women in this story, I thought of them. The way that I have organized my telling of the story is that I will say a sentence, and that will then be followed by gestures and movements that are of a mixture of American Sign Language and Plains Indian Sign Language. I shall begin. Grandmother prepares something to eat. She 
she who feeds the warrior. needs a strong backbone. Peace follows the cycle of Grandmother Moon. Escucha, escucha. A dwelling for nations who accept the message of peace. The great tree of peace unites the one family. The decision council of clan matrons. The next video I will show, it's another short video. It's of the Plains Indian Sign Language from a Nakoda man. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, the, um, yes, right here. So you can see this is some of our source material. And um, It's hard to see because it's an old video, and, uh, but here it is. One ounce, and then knock hold on. It's hard to get in. It's dark here, and I'll tell you how I'm going to eat. I'm going to coach him, man. Took them in hand, man. Soak it up, man. Sampajet how we see I in each other's in Iache Dona Mushnishnip. I ain't bore who use a cheap. A case a dam gas. We owe the honey da bagia. Yabi hunger. 
Um, so this ends, um, um, I wanted to present a lecture like this in this, um, in this, um, informal, in this more formalized way through a poetry fiction. And then, um, and so now I give it back to the moderator. And, um, so now I am done so i give it back to you and if you want to open it up so people can talk yes go ahead all right so i'll, I'll invite our audience members to if you have any questions you can hit the q a uh, meanwhile uh, i just want to bring up one little thing there uh, so one of the things that you mentioned is like the use of sign language right and how it kind of builds that bridge so mm -hmm. I noticed like with a lot of our languages, we do come from a specific language group. Yeah. So we all have these little language pods and then we kind of bridge off into our communities. But because our language is so connected to the lands and to our stories, that a lot of that language is localized, right? So we have words that may not exist outside of our communities. And so it makes sense that in order to bind that language when relating to other communities or having those dialogues or trade routes and things that we did incorporate sign language when we spoke this way it was very clear and provided a really good context right and so i like how that was mentioned mm -hmm. yes and um right now um indigenous language learning in canada is searching for the right method um everybody so one week language camp, camps have flourished all across Canada. And, um, but we must always ask ourselves, are they working? Are people coming out of those camps learning a language? And um, when people go to university, do they come out learning a language? Are they able to communicate with, with uh, their fellow <coughs> speakers? And um, so you almost, we must always ask this question. In sign language, within a three, four day workshop, you can learn 60 to 100 words and phrases. And you're able to use them right away. Yeah. So you come here, sit down. Uh, you, want, uh, you want coffee? Like, uh, and you say, yes. And I say, okay, this, this week, then uh, make it come. It's come. It's uh, it's ready now. You can drink it. And uh, how are you? I guess. And he could say, uh, bad, not good. So uh, it's a way because sign language is meant to be used between people. It's not and not to worry about the endings or the beginnings of words. That comes after once you're familiar with uh, sixty to a hundred phrases and words and using them. Th those are just the, the easy part is afterwards is the endings and beginnings to speak it, but you got to start using it. And um, 
So that's what we propose when we do sign language, but also in terms of storytelling and indigenous performance, it's the, one of the basis to develop method. All right. So we have uh, three questions. We'll start with uh, Hasi, who asked, uh, thank you for the presentation, Floyd. Can you elaborate on the aspects of multidimensionality in the context of art creation? Um, just very quickly, for example, <clears throat> my good friend Roger Fox from Sweetgrass, he, all, he came to visit me one day and he told me, oh, we must like Sweetgrass because he said, we're well, going to talk about sacred beings, Yata Yukya. He said, uh, so when you mentioned, when we start talking about them, he said, they're present, they listen to us. There, that's multidimensionality, for example. So. That's just a brief, quick anecdote for your question. Thank you for asking. Okay. Uh, Newton asks, how long ago was Indian Sign Language developed? I would say um, um, <clears throat> at creation, because um, the human being differentiates, is different from uh, the animal beings and the uh, other, the, uh, the bird and the, uh, insect people in his ability or his creation given gift through a bolt of lightning in the mouth, genetic imprint, formulating language and structure. Also, if you isolate people without language who are deaf, a deaf community, an experiment, I was reading this, a deaf Bedouin community in the Middle East, they already started to formulate like spoken language, verbs, subjects. So they had an innate language making system. So you could say the sign language was already born there because it's part of our language making system and communication system. Okay. All right, so Maya says, uh, could you expand on how PSSL can be used as a tool for the development of Indigenous performance method and future generation? Um, <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> in uh, Carleton, um, and also here in Montreal, I tried it. This, everything I taught was methods and systems I derived from indigenous systems like P, like Plains Indian Sign Language. It's part of the physical vocabulary of training. Um, so it's um, in um, at first I had also I used words and text combined with gesture and physical and sign language and winter count. I used text as well. But in the next part, the second part of the term, I didn't use language and just use gesture and sign in winter count. The reason for that is um, gesture and impulse must be the physical basis. That's almost like first year teaching or even sec first and second year teaching should be sign, gesture, movement and analyzing them theoretically by analyzing indigenous cultures who use them and starting to practice them. And then there at the next year is the story itself and applying these to the story. That's one example. Thank you. Uh, another question is, is the hero's journey story structure considered colonial? <clears throat> Not at all. <clears throat> if you understand, if you, listen to a lot of indigenous stories in their language, you will see they're all a narrative, a straightforward narrative. It's always a hero, a supernatural being. Um, how he became a supernatural being, something happened, he did something. He was blessed and he became a supernatural being. So um, all the stories, um, I have heard stork people say, Indigenous people had a non-linear structure. I have heard that, but have only heard and listened to stories 
that follow a very clear narrative, like uh, in the sacred stories, uh, means speaking of sacred beings. That's what we call storytelling. Atayokan is a spirit being. But now that we are in a month of April, what's coming up, we can't be telling those stories anymore. And um, so, but all of those stories, they follow a, they follow a very clear structure and narrative, a very clear narrative and action and dramatic action. All right, thank you. Uh, looks like we cleared the Q and A section, but I do have another question for you. So this is just as it applies to research. Uh, what advice would you give a potential researcher in the process of gathering stories as a form of research? Um, <clears throat> well, that's um, it depends how far you want to go with it. What you want to do, like um, in order to create innovation in indigenous education or arts or architecture, anything. To create that innovation, you gotta be a master of your indigenous culture. You gotta be born into it, grow up in it, even know the language. If you don't have that, at least you'll spend decades learning because in the Cree indigenous systems, it's like you have a long period of apprenticeship of being with scapios, 10 years, pollen rocks, for example, or 10 years chop wood, how about 10 years or 20 years? And um, so that my first advice would be, um, learn the context of where they come from, these stories. Because indigenous research is um, a few decades long process. To create innovation, you're looking at 20, 30 years of research and work. It's not something you can take a few workshops in uh, and then you kind of have a grasp and then you start innovating. Um, it, the, the true process, is, it's a long-term work. So that's, that's my answer to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions for you. Uh, so Ursula says, thank you for the inspiring talk, Floyd. Uh, could you tell a little how you apply the method to theater making? Uh, thank you. Unfortunately, I have to buy out. Good evening, she said. Oh. Um, theater making. So, for example, <clears throat> well, there's a few processes you can do, but one of the processes I used in these classes was we used the peacemaker story. Um, once again, I want to say I did it with permission. I asked elders, um, because indigenous people, we appropriate from indigenous people too, and appropriation is about permission or no permission. So um, <clears throat> in that story, we apply winter count to it, and then you apply sign language to it. And one of the results is what the young lady Maya presented. That's one of the process of she applied those principles to that story. And the result was an abstracted version of the peacemaker. So that's one, one example. There is many ways to do it. There is not one single way. Like in any experiment, it's endless. Thank you. All right, so Greg Allison asks, uh, thanks for the presentation. Are there common stories across Turtle Island that developed independently, but have commonalities? Oh, yes, I like all the um, Anishinaabe and Cree, um, um, for example, all their stories of the trickster. I won't say the trickster's name um, because in some place the snow has melted, but let's just use that word trickster. It's a common word. <clears throat> They're relatively the same, the same being, the same deeds, the same action. So they develop independently, <clears throat> but they have remarkable commonalities. Same with um, the sacred being of the Lakota people, uh, the spider being, Tony. Him too, he has the same stories as uh, 
our trickster team. So yes, there's commonalities there. That would also kind of go with our creation stories as well too, right? Yeah. They're similar. With a flood. And they all have a flood. Yeah. Uh, Hasi asks, uh, what would one book or talk on Indigenous storytelling would you recommend? Um, <clears throat> Basil Johnson's stories, his sacred beings, his talk of sacred beings, all the sacred being hierarchies and uh, of uh, the trickster's brothers, for example, their mother, all those. Uh, Basil Johnson is an excellent resource. And also um, historical documents, anthropological documents. Those are good sources for actual stories. For example, Voices of the Plains Scree. Finday talks about some very precise stories in there, the work chief Finday. Also, there is an anthropologist, an Austrian anthrop or German anthropologist from the 1860s. He talked with the people around Sault Ste. Marie, Bawating. He recorded their stories, and um, his name was Kosh, I think. Uh, he was a German, 1860s. The other one is Charles Eastman, a Dakota writer from the 1890s. Read his stories. I use one of his stories to teach super objective in stories. And super objective was a theatrical principle created by Stanislavski, a Russian uh, theater maker. But our stories had that. The idea of super objective is a universal principle. Okay, thank you. Uh, Newton asks, uh, earlier you mentioned inviting other cultures to perform along with the Indigenous performance method. What are some interesting collaborations you have seen or interesting stories you have been told? Um, I'll just refer directly to our festival. Um, I'm not saying there, I haven't seen anything else. Just to be, stay on point is, is uh, we are do, and we are going to do it again this summer is um, adaptation of the Trojan Women by Euripides, an ancient Greek classic. And that's a multicultural cast, but we're applying these indigenous methods upon that story and it's performed by multicultural cast. And the other one is, I was very much inspired by Tadashi Suzuki, a Japanese theater innovator from Japan, who I visited in Japan when I was a student. And I did see his classic and Russian adaptations filtered through the Japanese use of body and voice and his own method. Okay. Thank you, Floyd. Uh, it looks like we have all of our questions. Oh, there's another one. So here's another one. Uh, could you further explain the principle of winter count? I am sorry if I have misunderstood the spelling or pronunciation, that's for me, I guess. <clears throat> winter count is a Lakota system of looking at the events of the whole year and selecting one narrative image that speaks of that winter. So the winter when the buffalo fell through the ice, for example. The winter when smallpox came. They always have a verb in their sentence. So it's a narrative action, analytical method of the events of a whole year. So you take the basic principles and apply them to a text, a story. Look at that story. What is the essential image action of that story? So for example, in the, Romeo and Juliet, it's the, the um, taking of the poison, for example. In the story of the peacemaker, perhaps it's when um, the peacemaker, he combs, uh, he combs the, the giant's uh, hair, which is snakes. So um, that could be the principal image. From that one principal image, you select other images of that year, pretty soon you have of that story. Pretty soon you have a series of narrative action images that relate to that story. You've analyzed it using winter count. Now your next task is as an actor, performer, how do you incarnate these images? 
and then immediately you begin to take shapes and forms. What that young lady did and what also some of the pictures of the actors using signs and gesture, you start to incarnate it like this. You start to dramatize it. So that's one way of using winter count. It's a shorthand form, what I'm telling you, but it's actually many hours of preparation and research. Thank you. Uh, Newton asks, are there any places in Ottawa that you freak, that you know frequently shares Indigenous stories using an Indigenous performance mm -hmm. method? Um, <clears throat> I'm afraid I don't because um, um, so within the theater world and what we do at my festival on Palmaker with my collaborators like uh, Dr. Sabina Svetasen, Dr. Aneta Glowachka, Dr. Ula Nuremberg. Um, I think um, I would say we're one of the few, if, if not the only ones who have created an indigenous performance method in the world. So I don't know where else you could go. Uh, I'm not aware. I'm sure there is other places in the world to, to create an indigenous performance method but I have not heard of it. But in this country, is uh, we do that. We have been working on that in my community. Yeah, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your summer camp, your performance camp? This year, it's um, July 18th to um, 22nd. We combine it with a, a workshop in um, Plains Indian Sign Language. So we teach newcomers, what depends, it doesn't matter what level of language. We teach you 60 to 100 words and phrases with sign and phrase and word. And you can begin to use it. We teach them that. We teach and then we have lectures in the afternoon and in the evenings is performance. Interspersed with uh, some ceremonial protocols like sweat lodge or talking circle or teachings. So, and, and it's open to everybody. And because we believe as traditionalists, the traditionalists I work with, we must share our cultures and we must educate the world. So that's what we believe in and, uh, and that's what we practice. But also we're, um, um, I call it also an experiment in ceremony, performance and art, an experiment within an indigenous community. So that's what I'm calling it. So everybody's welcome. All right, and you have a website for that, right? Yes, Where... I have a website, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll share that on our webpage as well mm -hmm. so people can find it. Uh, yeah, I just have just a personal question just because you and I come from sister communities, right? So um, I come from Flutter Child, you come from Palm Maker. We have a lot of relatives in between, but Oh, you gifted me your book, uh, Ashes and Embers, and I'm just wondering about that whole process about gathering those stories. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, my mother was, was from Thunder Child, and my grandmother lived there into her old age, and my one uncle still lives there, Doug Starr, and all uh, my cousins, and um, Thunder Child was originally south, they lived in Delmas area. They were moved um, to the north beside Turtle Lake. But also in Thunder Child, is, um, there pre-existed an indigenous community with its own leaders, and they got amalgamated into Thunder Child. So the Turtle Lakers, right? There was already a, a chief there. His name was uh, Half Day, Noon. He's not really a chief, but a leader. So he, Turtle Lake was already its indigenous community. But anyway, Thunder Child was at Delmas and um, the process there was, it wasn't um, a process within a finite amount of time. Since I was young, I kind of heard stories here and there already. Um, I kind of knew all the stories by the time uh, I wrote the book. I heard from people who are now passed on, I read, um, 
So I already knew the basis, basics of the story, the main key points. And, but I knew a lot was being lost. And um, one of the sources was uh, Jack Funk's book, Outside the Woman Cried. He interviewed old Thunderchild people like John Noon, Caddy, and, um, and some from Palmaker like the late John Tetusis. And so already a lot of stories had been captured, but also a lot had been lost. And um, we managed to record some stories from these el from uh, elders who are my relatives. All of them in that book are they're my relatives. They knew my dad. My dad was related to all of them, and uh, they knew my mother. So already we had a rapport, and. Um, a and a trust and our ewa we had a relationship already and so the process but also there was some it was difficult because we had to go to delmas we had to go to graveyard and um so to this day it's still uh, now that um it's out there i just think i guess that's how whatever the spirit of creativity wanted that story to be told and people never to forget it. And so now it's being distributed by Good Minds Press out of um, Six Nations and, um, and it got nominated for um, Indigenous Publishing Award at the SAS Book Awards. So I guess I could say it's like, I guess the ancestors, they want the story to be told because we had a lot of sweat lodges for these books for the work and for the, for the book. We always follow the ceremony. So it's ongoing, the process is still going. Yeah, yeah. I remember hearing the story from my, from my uncles as well. They were, well, we can't say it, but my, they, they were there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. Nobody, they don't say who burnt it. Mm. Um, which is fine. I never asked who burnt it. So yeah. Yeah. our relatives like, keep it confidential. Yeah, we know, but you know, it's 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 a it's a story that you hold dear, right? Yeah. But yeah, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Delmas is a residential school um, outside of North Battleford, probably about forty-five minutes outside of North Battleford. Um, it burnt down. Uh, but the story behind it is that the older kids let the younger ones know when to leave. And so nobody was harmed. But yeah, there was the burning down of the residential school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was <clears throat> one of our interviewees, Gavin Baptiste, calls the, the people burnt it down heroes. Mm -hmm. so, that's what it was. It was a heroic event. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So if there are no other questions, um, I guess we could wrap this up. Um, if you want to see this, this has been recorded. Uh, it will be posted on our Anico website, along with a few of our other talks. This is Floyd's first talk as our visiting scholar. He will have others. Uh, just I'll keep you posted when they are shown. It'll be probably in the top five or it'll be posted on our website. So do you have anything else to say to end this off, Floyd? Um, nothing except just general comments of thank you. And um, um, <clears throat> I was just curious on um, people's reactions on when I say Indigenous identity is an obsolete construct. So, um, and um, so I'm just curious to see if uh, anybody picked up on that or maybe we can talk about it next time because it's very much in the news nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's almost like uh, the word has been destroyed by, uh, I guess by <clears throat> pretendians or fake or distant, it's like, and the ones, who are still disadvantaged are the brown ones, the accent, poverty, remote. Those still remain, but they're not benefiting from uh, these equalization initiatives. 
meant to enable them to participate in society. And, uh, and so I see that even today at the university, I've seen these, they look like North, from Northern Quebec. So I wanted to talk to them and I could see the vulnerability there, the fear and, and I thought, great, you're in university. That's mm -hmm. good, you're, but you're very visible. It's very right. different from people who are claiming indigenous identity and they're not visible and they don't have those obstacles, but they take advantage of those uh, opportunities. So um, it's like that in the theater too. So I know that's very much what people are talking about nowadays. And uh, so anyways, um, I just, for me, it's still a question because I think of our poor Indian people still trying to make it, but they still face these obstacles. And that's that. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Floyd. Thank oh, they got one more. You ready? Uh, it says, Wendy says, thanks so much for this. My question is, could you make sure these talks are publicized? I'm looking forward to the next one. So I'll, I'll make sure it's up there. <laughs> yes. All, any comments I make are within the context of my research in Indigenous performance. I'm not just up here spouting off uh, crazy theories and ideas. <laughs> so, uh, it's all within that. That's why I created a method. We don't have to talk about identity because it's a dead construct. We can create methods. So, um, so I'm sorry like if I sound uh, nationalistic by making like provocative comments. I don't mean to do that. I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. So um, uh, that's that, yeah. Uh, somebody says, thanks again, Floyd. Wonderful talk. Appreciate the time and, and the sharing. So, Okay, thank you. There's another thank you. Another thank you. Getting some thank yous there. Great presentation, Floyd. Okay. <laughs>